My name is Duncan Quinn, and uh, this is my life, so welcome to it. I went to a school that was very good at fencing. I played a little bit of rugby, but I was mostly good at sciences and mathematics. Um, very good, some might say. Weirdly, I ended up becoming a lawyer. Uh, my father was a detective at Scotland Yard, um, and he was actually in one of their special units that's called The Flying Squad. There's a movie that just came out about it this week, I think, with Ray Winston in it that's called Sweeney. Because the Sweeney was the nickname for the Flying Squad. My dad was in the Flying Squad. So the only people he ever saw make money were lawyers. He never met a banker, obviously. And uh, so he thought it would be nice for me to go off and become a lawyer. Which, you know, I tried and I have three law degrees and I've been a lawyer in London and a lawyer in New York and it just never really stuck. So um, I'd always been very creative and I'd always been the guy who was making things, you know, I wanted to be an architect when I was a kid, and I kind of look at what I do now a little bit as like architecture for bodies. It's something where you have to be extremely good spatially, because you're essentially putting together things in 3D to make sure that they fit on a 3D shape, which is pretty difficult. Um, and that's really where a lot of the skill comes into it. A chimpanzee can take the measurements, which is why it makes me laugh when people ask how many measurements do you take, how many fittings are there, you know, and you go to these websites where it's like, oh, we'll make you a bespoke suit, and here's all the list of measurements and how to take them. But, you know, a lot of the kind of um, the secret sauce that really makes things special is not necessarily in the measurements. It's, it's the measurements that you take, but it's also how you interpret them and how you turn that into the sort of 3D reality of what you're trying to put together. There's two things that kind of play into how I was feeling when I did this. One, I was the guy who ran all the nightclub parties when I was 18, 19, 20. So I was quite familiar with the idea of kind of risk, doing things that might fall flat on their face and being creative to make sure that they didn't. Um, you know, I started doing little things with a couple of hundred people. I ended up flying over people like Todd Terry, Roger Sanchez, guys like that to England back in the early 90s. Um, and so I'd, I'd run businesses before, I guess, that were kind of quite creative. And also, I stayed being a lawyer while this was getting up and running. I mean, I didn't leave the law firm for four years after I started this. I had other people here doing it. I would just kind of, I would design everything. I would make sure everything got made properly. I would come down here and do bespoke appointments, but most of the time I was still working as a lawyer full time, paying the bills for this place while it got off the ground. Where are we going now? This is where the old soldiers live. The old soldiers are basically bottles of wine that we've had during lunch or dinner that we have with the guys who come in here. And, you know, we tend to keep it kind of quite small groups. We normally do it for between 12 and 22 people. But, I mean, as you can see, I mean, these are okay. basically the finest wines you can ever find. I mean, Chateau de Brion, um, you know, Mouton Rothschild, Latour. I mean, there's just basically all the good stuff is here. If you like Bordeaux. Mm -hmm. Were you the best dressed guy at your, uh, at your I job? Mean, I, I, I thought I was, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, I, there's certainly a few people there, I think, who kind of raised their eyebrows. I mean, more than once I walked into a closing room for a deal wearing like a... Um, the suit that I, I like to think kind of started this because it used to get so many comments. It was it was a midnight blue three-piece suit with vermilion pink chalk stripes, and you know you got to remember this was probably like 1999, 2000 we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So I would walk into the closing room and literally all these bankers and accountants and other lawyers they would just go. And then you know mm -hmm. after they'd seen me come into the closing room a couple of times they didn't even notice anymore, but. It was always quite funny, the reaction it got, which is why it also makes me laugh that, you know, if you look at the way guys dress today, 10 years later, and if you look at photos of how they dressed back then, I mean, back then, no one wore colour. Everything fitted so badly, it was unbelievable. I mean, everyone was wearing suits that were like three times too big for them. Mm -hmm. It's great for the department stores because they didn't have to make anything that actually fit people and they didn't have to have people skilled enough to help them get something that fit them. Um, but the world has definitely moved on for the better. If a guy's going out to buy a suit, and he can't get it custom made. Like, what do you think are some of the things that you should keep in mind, like when you're buying a, a nice suit? Um, I mean, I think the same thing you keep in mind when you're coming here, because I think the part that people miss is that it really depends what you want it for. It's all great that you know it's made from some weird and wonderful fabric, and you know by this guy and whatever. But if it doesn't fit the purpose that you're buying it for, you're basically wasting your money because you're never going to use it. Um, you know, and then in terms of what do you look for in an ideal world? 
Um, it's difficult to answer. I mean, obviously you want something that's made as best as it can. That really kind of essentially just depends on what your budget is mm -hmm. because you generally tend to find, if you're lucky, that the price correlates with how much work went into it. One of these takes about 40 hours to make. It doesn't have any glue or fusing inside it. It's canvas and horsehair in here. It's put in by hand. Um, you know, there are, if you get a suit that's, that's made cheaply, it'll fall apart quicker, it doesn't last as long, so you're kind of paying for longevity as much as anything. It's like the old joke about, you know, penny rich, dollar poor. So tell us about the uh, bus tour. The bus tour sort of started actually as an idea many, many years ago of how I could open a store in the Hamptons and not have to pay rent. Because it just seemed crazy to me that you have to rent a store for 12 months, but you can only really have it open for two. Um, or at least open for two when it generates any revenue. Um, so I was going to buy a double-decker bus and I made the fatal schoolboy error of actually asking a lawyer in the Hamptons about how that would work and his response was it will never work because you'll never get the permits to do it so I didn't. But the idea was there and I guess you know many years later um, I was talking with you know one of the kind of liquor brands that I talk with a lot because we do lots of drinks things for the guys who come here you know, and I sort of was talking to them about doing something fun and I floated this idea of doing a double-decker bus tour and they loved it and so we kind of got together and we did it together. Um, and it was quite funny because I have a client called Christian Louboutin and he comes in here quite a lot, I mean client, friend, I guess, and uh, we see him pretty regularly. And I was telling him about this maybe three months ago and he literally laughed his pants off and he just sort of looked at me and he said, I did that in France with a French school bus. And he was like, you will not believe it, it break down the whole time, it was a disaster, you will eat it. And, uh, and it was quite funny because I bought this bus from a, a, a pub in Miami that's owned by an old English guy. And it's pretty well known, it's a really divey bar that has live music almost every night. And got the bus serviced, we checked everything out, you know, we were going to drive it to New York. We drove it 300 miles before basically the fuel injection system blew up and the bus came to a grinding halt and we had to then tow it 900 miles to New York. Um, but uh, we got it here, we completely refurbished it in 19 days, we took it pretty much from a wreck to a store downstairs and a speakeasy kind of tasting room upstairs and we've been doing dinners with really kind of good chefs. Uh, the Fat Radish actually did the food for New York. Um, and a lady called Elaine Duff, who is basically the head mixologist at Diageo. So she's pretty wizardly with uh, with cocktails, and she's been sort of making cocktails for us. So we've been dinner dinners, cocktails. We did that in New York for three days, and then we took it to Miami again, which is where it is right now. Did the same thing, and then in the end of March, beginning of April, we will be in Los Angeles doing it there. So it's kind of like a fancy party bus.